Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. It is about uh, having this narrative that democracy only leads to chaos and democracy never delivers. That is the overarching narrative for the authoritarian attacks. So I think one lesson is to let the people know that this is happening. And if you let everybody know that this is the narrative they're going to push, then people build immune system antibodies in their mind even before that attack actually happens. Welcome to Votonomics, where politics and markets and everything else collide. This year, voters around the world have the ability to affect markets, countries and economies like never before. So we've created this series, Votonomics, to help you make sense of it all. I'm Stephanie Flanders. I'm Adrian Woldridge. And I'm Allegra Stratton. And you heard at the top of the show, uh, the former, recently stepped down, Minister of Digital Affairs of Taiwan, Audrey Tang. Now, you might wonder why on earth, you know, we have all these illustrious people on this podcast, not least the people I'm talking to right now. Why would we have a recently stepped down Minister of Digital Affairs? But Audrey Tang, for the last several years, has been absolutely the front line of the misinformation war, uh, which, of course, we're all worried about um, being above and beneath the surface of these big elections that we're facing in the UK and the US and other countries. Because Taiwan, as she says herself, has been the country most subjected to cyber onslaught on all fronts, whether it's around the senior US politician Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, uh, and most recently the election where China clearly didn't want to have someone win uh, the presidency in Taiwan who was considered to be sort of pro-independence or some form of independence um, for Taiwan. I mean, Allegra, you and I spoke to her and it was just a fascinating conversation about Yeah, it was that. fascinating and it was quite chilling as well because when I was asking her if, if she, the incidences that we've seen in the UK of possible disinformation and, and um, Russian bots stirring up division and so on and, you know, and she said, yeah, and some. Like, it will be, <laughs> yeah, you know, it yeah, will exactly. be, yes, and it will be much more than that, A. Eh? And then the other thing that I, that really resonated and I liked a lot was this idea of jury service on social media so you could we we as citizens should all be dipping into various different pieces of social media and kind of observing in quite an intense way. Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to, he- to hearing it. So it's absolutely fascinating subject. But of course, we're interested in these things, even more interested in elections right now, because we have one. Um, and actually, we had that what was it, a snapcast that we did early this week of Votonomics when we had first got that news, the announcement from Rishi Sunak of the, of the election in early July. And I think that's the one thing we didn't talk about, actually, is the risk of misinformation. Well, it's interesting. I think that experts are divided. I think that the they, they feel that actually um, in the elections that we've already seen in 2024 around the world, that it hasn't actually played a huge role, but it is certainly right to be vigilant. I think there's absolute truth in that, but I think the extent to which this is going on is increasing all the time and the extent to which the sort of the Russian model of um, deliberately spreading, spreading misinformation and agitprop is being taken up by China and pushed forward is is is, is really quite important. And also, I think if you look at the what, what you might call the the states that abut uh, Russia, you know, the Baltic states and the rest of them, you see it as a lot, lot more of a problem than it has been here. So I think the future is um, is, is quite dark when it comes to misinformation. It's very hard to say definitively what's happening. And that's part of the issue is that you have this sort of echo chamber of different forms of social media, self-selected groups uh, who are then having damaging messages amplified. And Audrey Tang talks about it. But actually, I was struck by Anne Applebaum has done this fantastic a uh, big story for The Atlantic and this this uh, this month's June issue of The Atlantic magazine, The New Propaganda War, where she just maps out how China, Russia and other sort of semi-rogue nations are making common cause with sort of Make America Great Again Trumpian Republicans to spread a message around sort of undermining liberalism and undermining kind of normal democratic I think one values. of the many fascinating things that she said um, is that these countries are 
collaborating with each other. I mean, both Anne said this and, 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 and Audrey Tang said this. And I think we should be looking certainly to what Taiwan has been doing. But again, I also think we should be looking to what some of the Baltic states or some of the states on the uh, closest to Russia have been doing. And I think a really interesting example of that is Finland, which has in its schools a civic education program, which teaches people how to... Um, resist foreign propaganda because they're being constantly bullied and, and, and hectored by the Russians. And that's actually woven into their education system. So I think when we're thinking about what our defences should be, uh, we shouldn't just be thinking about the military. We should also be thinking about a much broader set of defences against foreign interference, which include you know, public opinion, public education. Do you think it would work here? Yes. Well, I think it's just, and I'm also just struck, we had our, our guest uh, last week who was saying when he goes to talk to students and they all yep. are sort of, many Absolutely. of them are parroting the same sort of somewhat sympathetic to Russia uh, line about Ukraine. And she actually, Anne Applebaum, uh, cites uh, having had, uh, talking to um, other Western diplomats who have sort of been been in Africa and then are sort of shocked by everywhere they go, people with a completely different narrative around um, the war in Ukraine and many of them believing this particular story around um, the US using biological warfare early on in you know hel helping Ukraine to commit biological biological warfare at the beginning of the war. So I think it is. It, it, there is a fear that even if you're doing all these things within your core, core education system um, and on your mainstream media, uh, the segmentation of the voices that people are getting, you just have very little now, there's, control. The, there's enemy agit prop, but there's also just rumours and just nonsense that that, that, that that is there on the social media all the time. We are very capable of generating the time. And we're, we're capable of generating our own nonsense. <laughs> yes. We and want to just have our nonsense. <laughs> and I think, you know, as this uh, British election unfolds, I think it's very important that we take a pretty broad view of, of public opinion, not just reading the Times, but also looking at some of the the weirder stuff coming out on the internet, or GB News and the rest of it. While we're talking about, you know, this sort of, uh, the risks of what might happen in the UK election, I think, you know, we also have that US election. We've been running a swing state poll because, as you, as you both will know, uh, the seven swing states, they are the ones that will decide the outcome of this election. And actually, the latest poll uh, has just come out, had some quite interesting results, particularly on this subject of uh, foreign interference and also the risk of violence in and around the elections. We can go back to our, our friend of Votonomics, Nancy Cook, our top reporter in Washington, covering all things campaign and economic policy and much else. Um, Nancy, I know you've we've had quite a few of these swing state polls, but what are the top lines from this one? Well, the top lines are that um, former President Trump uh, still leads Biden about 48 percent to 44 percent across the seven swing states that we have been surveying for the last several months. And, you know, this sort of builds on the success that he that we have seen in other polls with him where he has been leading uh, Biden. Um, I think what's interesting is that about 46 percent of the people we surveyed uh, expressed some concern about foreign interference. And then the other sort of big takeaway is that Trump is leading in states like North Carolina, Arizona, Georgia, which is a, a state with a lot of African-Americans, which will be key for Biden to win. And then the, they're tied in Nevada. Nancy, one of the things we're picking up on during this uh, Votonomics is this idea of echo chambers and that different voter groups are sort of talking to themselves and not really straying outside. And the and the poll underscores that. It's, it's deeply partisan. So you have nine out of 10 Republicans saying the economy was better off under Trump and only one out of 10 Democrats thinking that. So you've got this very, very strong um, expression of, of, of how partisan this election is. Absolutely. And, and you just see that across the board with almost every policy area. I mean, you see that, you know, Trump really earns high marks on the economy from, you know, all Republican voters. You see that also with foreign policy, housing, immigration. Um, it's just it is so polarized that it's almost like two different countries at this point, the Democratic states and the Republican states. And that's why we have focused on these swing states, because, you know, there's so much of the U.S. that's basically you already know how people are going to vote. Um, and, and these states are the ones that are kind of up for grabs. 
Nancy, are you surprised that the current Trump trial hasn't had more of an impact on voting intentions so far? I, I'm actually not, um, because I think that, uh, one, we're still many months away from the election. Two, I think Americans are very disengaged right now from this particular election. I think most Americans don't want either President Biden or former President Trump to be their candidates. And so I think people aren't paying a ton of attention to the trial. The fact of the matter is, is that the first indictment that Trump had actually was great for him. It helped him with fundraising. It helped him with the Republican base. It was something that boosted him, actually. So, you know, I, I just think it hasn't hurt him at all. And I think if there is a conviction, which we have to wait and see, it will only help him. But that is interesting, Nancy, because, uh, as you know, polls of Republicans had suggested that around a third of his support would consider it um, material if he got a felony conviction. You think that's just gone away now? I'm just not sure that that will hold and that will be the thing that will sway people on Election Day versus things like immigration and the economy. I think that uh, people's sense of the economy and their dismay with it is so strong that I'm just not sure that that will uh, overshadow a conviction. The very top line I saw in one of the headlines around this uh, poll is that you know a half, and that's Democrats and Republicans, fear... Uh, violence around the election, which I'm not sure whether we were asking people that in the last election or certainly, you know, last 20 years. But that seems very striking. It is striking. And I think that's all because of January 6th and the violence and the you know attempted insurrection that happened after the last election. It has been so interesting covering politics in the wake of that because a ton of the Republican Party has basically rewritten history on that and come to see them as a, as a protest, you know, not that big of a deal. Um, but I think that regardless of who wins in November, Democrats or Republicans, there's a fear that whoever is the loser, there will be a lot of protests and there will be violence. And, and I think it's, it's really a, a stark uh, data point in this poll. I did notice we had a fascinating piece um, by uh, Josh Green uh, earlier the, the last couple of days that, that f pollsters and focus people taking f focus groups on both sides weren't looking for it, but kept on tripping up over people concerned that President Trump, if re-elected, would then try to stay in office beyond the four years and violate um, the, the constitutional limit on two terms. Yeah, I love that piece as well. And and I think that it is a concern among particularly independents. And it's something that Trump keeps joking about. I mean, it's not really something that's just in voters' minds. It's something that he keeps talking about. Um, he spoke before the National um, Rifle Association in Dallas, Texas uh, on Saturday, and he joked about, you know, winning a third term. You know, in the U.S., you can only win two terms. That's what the law says now. And so he joked about serving even beyond that. I mean, he has made these comments before, so it's not really out of left field that this is something that is on the minds of American voters. But I thought it was interesting that it's coming up in these focus groups now, as Josh reported. So, Nancy, do you enjoy the TV debate spin rooms? Uh, I think they're fine. <laughs> I mean, you know, what's interesting, though, is that the debates that they recently agree to, uh, you know, they will have the spin rooms, I'm sure, but they're not going to be before an audience. And so it will be interesting to see, you know, how those end up looking um, on TV, but then also what they look like afterward. Why are they not going for an audience? I think that they uh, it was one of the conditions that Biden um, and his team put forward to debate Trump. I think Trump is so masterful at sort of owning the media, owning the room, um, sort of overtaking a situation. And we saw that in a CNN town hall that he did just with him and a CNN moderator. He kind of just flipped the whole situation to his advantage. And mm -hmm. it was a very sympathetic audience. And they kept sort of interrupting the moderator, interrupting the follow-up questions. And I think the Biden people wanted to feel like it was, you know, President Biden really had a fair shot to make his points and that people stuck to the time limits. And they felt like if there was a studio audience, that person, you know, it would have just been even more disruptive. But it's a huge gamble, um, which we will be looking at to see how it turns out. Nancy Cook, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So now on to that interview with Audrey Tang. Taiwan's former Minister of Digital Affairs. She's literally just stepped down. And she feels Taiwan has been many years ahead of the rest of the world in having to respond to the threat of 
misinformation and cyber wars influencing elections. So I started by asking her, how does she think we're doing so far and what do we need to learn before going to the ballot boxes later in the year? Taiwan has been on the forefront because we're the most heavily targeted. And according to VDEM, for the past decade, every year, we're the top of the world in terms of the foreign information manipulation received. And we know something uh, about uh, information manipulation. And uh, it's not just elections. When the Ministry of Digital Affairs first started in August 2022, a few weeks before that, Nancy Pelosi, the then US speaker, visited Taiwan in a historic visit. And we saw the whole spectrum of destructive attacks, hack and leak, encouraging physical products. Uh, and all that in a very coordinated way. It's about creating a information vacuum. It is about uh, having this narrative that democracy only leads to chaos and democracy never delivers. That is the overarching narrative for the authoritarian attacks. So I think one lesson is just to pre-bunk, to let the people know that this is happening. This is not about pro a candidate or against a candidate. This is about an overarching narrative uh, that says democracy never delivers, democracy only leads to chaos. And if you pre bunk it, if you let everybody know that this is the narrative they're going to push, then people build immune system antibodies in their mind even before that attack actually happens. So just to explain that Nancy Pelosi visit, you know, obviously the Chinese government had not wanted any senior US politician to visit Taiwan. So that's why you had that kind of concerted attack. And the more recent time when people were concerned about Taiwan was around the time of the election at the start of this year. Um, Were you applying some of the same lessons for that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, For example, in every election, we already know that uh, the counting process is going to be the main attack for not just every attack, but mostly information operation. Uh, people would accuse uh, that the counting was rigged. People would accuse the election officials of siding with one particular candidate. People would dispute the result of the election and so on. These are all traditional information operation uh, targets. In Taiwan, we counter that by uh, participatory counting. So for the past few years, we restructured our accounting process. We have a paper-only ballot. uh, And so when people count those paper-only ballots, they take each and every one out. They show it to three different angles. And the three major parties, their YouTubers, their recorders, their participatory counters, uh, they all film the process. And so each and every paper ballot was counted this way. So we didn't use digital technology to speed up the tallying process, even though maybe electronic tallying can finish what used to take four hours and 40 minutes, we conclude it's not worth it. The participation is important because when the inevitable information operation happens right after the counting process concluded that there was rigged counting and so on and so forth, actually, it didn't spread very far. Even though we have evidence that foreign information manipulators put a lot of resource in getting all those conspiracy theories to spread, all the three party leaders, they have their YouTubers and their uh, campaign people uh, in that particular counting station. It's all documented. So all they can uh, say after the fact is that there's no rigging of the election. So it uh, limits the basic reproduction number, the R0 value of those information manipulation. So even though they threw a lot of resources into spreading this particular message, we fixed this problem by inviting everybody into the counting process. This is something that is electronic uh, tallying cannot do as easily. Audrey, the way you're describing recent events is very sophisticated digital literacy. Tell us your observations looking at these huge elections um, in the UK, in America, and how resilient you think those electorates really are. In Taiwan, we don't even use the word digital literacy or media literacy anymore in our curriculum. We always say digital media competence because literacy is when you are viewing the news, maybe with a critical eye, but still mostly as a consumer, whereas competence is when you're a co-producer of information. And the great thing about getting high schoolers or even primary schoolers into the collaborative fact-checking is that it changes their family dynamic. Usually the children, when they introduce a new platform, a new ecosystem and so on, the parents and grandparents are sympathetic to it. And what we have found is that it is not the checked facts that inoculates the mind. It is the act of going through fact-checking, of thinking like a journalist that inoculates the mind, which is why it's so important to combine that with the curriculum and with this all-family exercise. 
when you look at America and the UK and the many, many other polls taking place this year around the world, do you think people know what's coming? I think what's really needed is that it comes from not just credibly neutral sources, which I understand in the US it's uh, difficult to come by now, uh, but rather uh, from each and every party, from each and every denomination, from each and every even religion uh, and so on, community leaders and so on. I just published a book on this. It is about uh, collaborating across people who were like ideologically or politically opposite of each other, but each side agreed that democracy is a process that requires some commonly agreed facts. And for that, we need cross-checking instead of just taking one institute and upholding it as the most rigorous. So a cross-checking ecosystem is always superior to just a single, like this information oversight institute or things like that when it comes to pre-bunking and debunking issues. And the other thing, uh, especially for career public servants, is that even if you didn't anticipate something and you cannot uh, pre-bunk it, as long as you respond within an hour, it's as good as if you've pre-bunked it. So we ensure in Taiwan that if we missed some pre-bunking targets, we always respond with a hopefully slightly humorous message uh, on mass media 60 minutes or less after we detect that it is going to trend. And the reason why is that the Korea Public Service, through the press release channels, actually reaches more people than conspiracy theories. And if it's a little bit humorous, it also spreads faster uh, than the conspiracy theories. So for an average person, they actually receive the clarification first uh, before they receive the disinformation. You were a pioneer, uh, Audrey, developing open source technology before going into government, but also you've been a force for this very collaborative, transparent process, um, which you were just describing. I mean, I think that's built up a level of trust, which you're not always going to get um, with other kinds of government fact-checking in other countries. In fact, I, I was struck by a recent example in Senegal where there'd been a fake news law that actually was associated with the incumbent government, in effect, trying to prevent a lot of opposition discussion on TikTok and in other places. And funnily enough, that law backfired because this opposition leader had been somewhat silenced by those laws but there was so much curiosity about him that people went out and found out about him and they ended up voting him into office um but in a lot of cases uh you know don't we see that it is in fact quite authoritarian governments that are then using the language of fake news and talking about citizens needing to be protected from it so how do you how do you develop trust and avoid that problem Yes, I think this is a, a great observation. Taiwan is the top of Asia when it comes to not just uh, freedom on the net, but also journalistic freedom. And because my parents were both journalists, I would never say the words oh. fake news to them or to anyone really, because to me, information manipulation is fundamentally about uh, getting people to distrust the democratic process. This is not about pro or anti-establishment, pro or anti any parties and so on. For the polarization attacks that we have seen for most of this year, after the generative AI capabilities getting enjoyed by all the information manipulators, the easiest way is not to push for fake narratives, but just to amplify the parts of the um, opinions that uh, looks like hate messages across party lines, across uh, ideological lines, and just put a lot of resources in amplifying those polarized messages. And then the polarization um, hurts the democracy by itself. And fact checks can do uh, little about such polarization attacks because it's not factually wrong, right? So I think a lot of the work that we're now doing uh, is, again, pre-bunking. We introduce new laws like the Anti-Fraud Act currently in the parliament that says if you want to have freedom of reach through advertisement, you have to digitally sign your message and not just the people paying it, but also the, the people appearing in it. If it's from a celebrity, the celebrity need to sign it digitally. And that applies to foreign advertisements too. So there's no exceptions. It wants to ensure the authenticity of the actor without saying anything about the content. We've seen more and more that the content level laws do a lot of 
collateral harm, even with the best intentions, exactly as you pointed out, because it also interferes uh, with the journalistic work. Uh, and I understand that there are similar laws in the works in both US and the UK. And my sincere hope is that these can be passed before the election, because otherwise it's not just fake versus true anymore. It is a lot about just inauthentic portrayal of celebrities and so on. Audrey, I would say when we spoke in in Taipei at the end of last year, I would say you were quite calm about some of the sort of straightforward uh, deep fakes that people have talked a lot about here in the context of the election. You know, things coming out just before the election that show one of the candidates saying something or doing something. Um, but I was I noted that you were much more concerned about the potential for AI to produce very kind of individualized fakes. So you know, not just a fake video, um, but technology allowing uh, the manipulator to build up a relationship with an individual person. So maybe just talk us through, talk us through that so we too can be frightened. So after the election in January, I think I was right in not worried about the polarization attacks because the effective polarization, how people hate each other across party lines, went into a historic low. All three parties felt that they have won a little bit. So there's no winner takes all, loser loses all dynamic. And it's very good for the health of our democracy and mental health for everyone involved. But I do see that this direct communication, this precision persuasion as a ongoing threat. The idea is that if you have a addictive app that people use. In Taiwan, for example, the short form videos, people like it just like any other country. We're a little bit fortunate in that we've been saying for quite a few years that TikTok is a harmful product for cybersecurity. So it only has about a quarter of installation base in Taiwan and only about one tenth of that use it as their primary platform. So we're not as addicted as some other <laughs> jurisdictions are to TikTok. But TikTok is just one example because what it does is already has a reward model, right? It knows what ticks you and what addicts you. And so instead of just spreading one single message to try to get people to retweet or whatever, that was like the previous wave of information manipulation. Nowadays, decision targeting AI can just push of a series of messages let you feel a little bit more disenfranchised, a little bit more disempowered, a little bit more apathy around the democratic process. But if you are addicted to it, and if you watch it hours and hours every day, then the end result is that you lose energy to participate in the democratic processes. So it is even more insidious and chronic than polarization. And I think this is something that we need really to watch out for. Talk us through that. But how can one pre-bunk or pre-inoculate against that? It just feels so sophisticated. Yeah, one way is simply to let people know that this form of addiction, everything else being equal, is not good for them. In the US, of course, as we know, for TikTok in particular, they are now setting a timeline so that they, it needs to divest, right? It need to sell to a US uh, operator who hopefully uh, will instill a uh, more digital democracy capabilities into the app. Because people, if they're already addicted to it, nowadays there's research that says if you adjust the uh, sorting algorithm a little bit to promote, for example, authentic self-disclosure or promote a little bit more vulnerability, a little bit more ideas of communicating across societal differences, a little bit more collective sense-making and all that instead of the addictive entertainment stuff, it actually results in the same amount of engagement, whereas it uh, makes people care more about democracies. Or maybe all it takes is a few hyper-parameter changes, and then it gets people on social media to be more pro-social rather than antisocial. So maybe that's another experiment that whenever false TikTok can try. <laughs> Got it. I love the idea of after an election, all parties feeling like they won a bit uh, and feeling like they hate each other less. We can only hope. Um, you, you mentioned the US approach. There's obviously been a specific bill there addressing TikTok, which may end up um, applying to other platforms. The EU has had its own package of digital services legislation, which it brought out uh, at the end of the year. I mean, how, how would you compare um, the EU's approach to that of, say, the US or the UK? Yeah, I think the EU approach of assigning 
more liabilities and more duties to the gatekeepers is definitely a robust approach because as soon as some platform reaches a certain percentage of the people, it doesn't matter where it comes from. It now has to comply with these duties. In fact, in our Anti-Fraud Act, that's precisely the approach that we take. So even if you're a foreign operator, as long as you hit X percent of active Taiwanese user space and you sell advertisements, you're required Audrey, you've been really eloquent describing all the different policy levers and mechanisms that democracy can put in place to try and protect itself or, in your phrase, inoculate itself against these problems. But can you just reflect for us, just taking a step back, on the the, the threat, the enemy, the stimulus, the people that are seeking to spread these untruths? And I, I want to give you an example. In the UK a few years back, um, there's obviously been incidents since, but there was a very high profile example where our footballers missed a bunch of penalties in the Euros. Um, uh, for your information, a high profile football t- tournament, there was abuse and they a huge abuse. Now, some of that abuse may have come their way anyway from domestic social media accounts. But equally, there was evidence that some of it was also stirred up from abroad. Uh, it seemed to be compounded, whipped up, amplified by foreign social media accounts. Can you just describe for us, is that kind of phenomenon here to stay? Is it going to get worse? Is it already very bad? And we just don't realize it. Just give us a stock take. So when it comes to elections, uh, we can always start from the ordinary, right? The classic cyber intrusions, cyber enabled vote tampering, unauthorized access, data theft, and things like that. And ransomware and so on. All, all these are still here to stay. They're not going away. What worries us is that it's now evolving into what's called hybrid capabilities. So instead of just a DDoS attack denying the service of governmental agencies' websites, coupling that with amplifying information operation material so that when fact checkers want to access the source of truth, they found the source of truth is denied service, whether it's a media outlet or whether it's a ministerial website. Or as we mentioned, a hack and leak about a campaign and so on, but then using the leak material to do AI abuse and deep fakes and so on, uh, literally putting words uh, into the hacked victim that they didn't say, but because the hack material contains maybe videos or sufficient amount of sound files, it sounds and looks very real and so on. So these are the new capabilities, new as of um, last year or so, that were extra worried because then the cyber intrusions are bad enough. But previously, it, it would take a very resourceful adversary and many different tries before it reaches the common people. But now, amplified by this precision persuasion and AI abuse and deepfakes, they can afford to do each try with minimal or negligible cost. And so they can just keep trying until a narrative hits and then we have a viral information manipulation. So which is why it is so important to have this digital signature scheme, because it means that one person can only have one account. If you want to open pseudonyms, that's fine. But you sign it in a way, it's called zero knowledge, that still lets people know that it is just a single person, maybe anonymous, a single person behind it. No longer can one simply register 10,000 accounts and wait for most of them getting banned or whatever, but still activate the rest of the accounts to look like it's astroturfing and so on, look like there's a groundswell of support and so on. And all these are going to be very difficult to tell from actual groundswell support, because if you click into each account's profile, live history, interaction, it looks completely real. It's uh, now generative AI made. So I think digital signature really is one of the new bedrocks that we need to instill into those larger platforms this year. At the time, there was a debate, you know, on the one hand, we're suggesting that this has been uniquely whipped up abroad and that this would never have happened if it weren't for foreign media accounts making things worse. But equally, we have to focus and analyze ourselves, don't we? That, that is certainly true. And also, if you're on x.com or Twitter, there's this jury duty that you can enter called community notes. And I participate in the community notes just to improve my media competence. And if you participate in the community notes community, very quickly, you can see all sorts of information manipulators going on, trying to sway uh, the public opinion one way or another. And uh, I attended uh, the Google Jigsaw conference a couple of months ago. 
And there were a lot of conversation around these. And Google Jigsaw did release a new set of capabilities, a new set of API. Instead of just detecting the toxicity and so on, it now also measures democratic bridge making abilities. So for each and every note, you can actually gauge how much pro-social it is compared to your ordinary hate messages and so on. So it's not just weeding out the toxic or the hate, but actually nudging people to provide pro-social services online. And I think this is, is also very helpful if it can be applied to more social media platforms. So I guess, I mean, before we finish, I just there's one fundamental thing which comes out of what you said right at the beginning. And you said the common feature of a lot of these attacks, what you're trying to pre-bunk, is the idea that democracy doesn't deliver, that it produces chaos. I mean, I guess, you, you know, you have to then also, as well as doing all the things you're talking about, you, as a government, you have to work on that not being true, actually, on on actually delivering for people. Because if their lived experience is chaos and political dysfunction, like we've seen in many places, you know, there's no point trying to debunk that if actually people have feeling in their daily lives like democracy is not delivering. Yeah, uh, I think exactly as uh, you observed, if people think of democracy only as uh, voting every two years or four years, very small bandwidth, just a few bits, very long latency for change to happen or uh, to see it actually not happen, uh, then obviously there's going to be a, a pathy, right? But I think a lot of the online ecosystems, the fact-checking ecosystem, the COVAX, the participatory budgeting, the initiatives of not just referenda, but community initiatives and so on, they are there because it's a continuous democracy. It is something that people can feel every day as long as people employ those democratic tools in their lives more, maybe in their community, in their schools, in their churches, uh, I think the word democracy uh, will have a much more nuanced meaning. The more people have the stage to show affinity, compassion, curiosity, nuance, sharing personal stories, reasoning and respect of each other, the more people are going to associate the word democracy with some lived experience that is actually pro-social. So I'm not saying that let's just protect the election. I'm saying that leading up to the election, let's protect our lived experience around democracy on a smaller scale, uh, lowercase d democracy. But but yeah, but the elected politicians actually have to deliver on things people care about, like education and health. Yes, which is why we need to do both. We need to build a grassroots legitimacy that's hopefully higher than any of the political parties. And then we need to hold those parties into account, uh, actually delivering what the people want. So, Audrey, you've now stepped down. I think you were one of the youngest ministers when you joined the government. And you're now, I we're hearing from you, going to be travelling a lot more outside Taiwan. So I hope you're going to be able to spend lots of time with uh, our governments and help them protect everyone against, protect ourselves um, against some of the things that you're talking about. Yeah, Taiwan can help uh, and uh, stand ready uh, to help. Uh, in fact, I'm going through a bunch of uh, European countries uh, as we uh, are airing this episode, going across seven different countries in just 22 days. The idea is that trying to come to each jurisdiction like three or four months before they are having a election and just connect with the officials, the civil society leaders uh, to share what works in Taiwan, and also to share uh, the kind of community grassroots toolkits that everybody can just adopt. And if people coordinate, I'm sure that this year uh, will be not a democratic uh, setback, but rather a democratic revitalization. Oh, I hope so too. Maybe in a few months, uh, we'll have to we'll have to find out from you how you mark each of these countries that you've met. Great. With. Happy to be back uh, on the podcast. Audrey Tang. Thank you so much. Thank you. Live long and prosper. Okay, that is more than enough for this week's second episode of Votonomics. Thanks for listening. This episode was hosted by me, Stephanie Flanders, Allegra Stratton and Adrian Waldridge. It was produced by Summer Sadi with help from Chris Martlou and Julia Manns. Editorial direction from Victoria Wakeley. Brendan Francis Newnham is our executive producer. And Sage Bowman is head of Bloomberg Podcasts. With special thanks to Nancy Cook and Audrey Tang. Please, if you like it, subscribe, rate and review this show wherever you listen to your podcasts.